Well, various uh, people have mentioned Janet's collection of conferences, which was published and entitled From Highway, well, Highways and Byways. And I've taken that as um, a framework for what I'm going to talk about to finish the presentations part of our conference this afternoon. Um, some of you who were here last year will have heard some of this before. I'm not making claims for anything new here. Um, but there was a lot. There were a lot of people who said, "Oh, can't you just do all of that again?" And I, <laughs> I thought, "No, I can't." But I was happy to try to bring together some of it in this new presentation, in a new framework. And I'm going to start with um, a passage too that most of you will now be familiar with, because Kathy also used it in her letter for the feast um, of the Sacred Heart. And it happens to be one of my favourite quotes from Janet Stewart. And I think it was when I came across this quote, when I was reading Maud Monaghan about three years ago, or four years ago even, that I realised that this was a person I was interested in and could, could relate to and wanted to find out more about. So, so there we are. In July... 1914, Janet Stewart wrote a thank you letter to the Roehampton community with whom she had briefly been staying after her journey round the world and before she returned to the mother house in Brussels to settle down, as she thought, to the real work of being Mother General. She wrote, The spiritual world is so rich, tropically rich, and one longs to explore it and speak of it to those who care, and that is all of us. I found on my travels the beatitude of hunger and thirst for the things of God all through the society. And I'm quite sure that we must work in the vein of spiritual things, and especially spiritual conversations, to get something for our own hunger and thirst and something to give others. I think it's fascinating that after three years of travelling around the world, with plenty of leisure, at least during her time at sea, to reflect on her experiences of meeting communities in different corners of the globe, Janet returned to base to begin her real time, inverted commas, as Mother General, fired with a vision of working in the vein of spiritual things and convinced of the importance of spiritual conversations not only to satisfy one's own hunger and thirst but to get something to give other people. She had already written to somebody and I haven't found the original source of this but I think it may have been Cardinal Bourne who is the person who quotes it She'd already written to X, whoever it was, that on her return from Australia and America in 1914, that her head was full of plans for the future, though they would have to wait, for, she said, people are not ready for them now. Perhaps she was at the brink of a refocusing of interest, away from school and college education, to putting more energy into the work of retreats and, as she calls them, spiritual conversations with, in all my inverted commas here, persons of the world. The fourth means, as it was called in the 1815 constitutions. I suggest that Janet Stewart has most to give us today as an educator in prayer and in spiritual life. I think she's a good educator in these matters because her teaching was drawn from her own struggles. Mary has told us about how Janet drew on this experience to share something with others, particularly in the novice-ship. My focus in this paper is on her own experience and how some of that spilled over even in the last months of her life in the conferences that she gave to her religious. 
Can we have the next slide, please? In 1909, Janet gave a conference to the Roehampton community entitled Highways and Byways in Spiritual Life. It's the title conference of that collection I referred to. Her title may have been an allusion to a famous series of guidebooks to different regions in the British Isles, published by Macmillan between 1897 and 1948. So there was highways and byways in Sussex, highways and byways in uh, Northamptonshire and Rutland, though that was published in 1918, and many others of the same sort of um, title. Each author of these books was allowed to approach their subject as they saw fit. Some focused more on the historical or folk traditions of the area, some on its geography or its natural history. The point in Janet's essay was a spiritual one, to remind her audience that there are many paths to holiness, apparently incompatible in themselves, but leading to the same end, to God. There were the busy highways of business, good works, planning meetings and public duties. The paths taken by bishops, clerics, theologians and philosophers, by the heads of schools and colleges, and by implication, by superiors of convents or leaders of vicariates. There were also the contemplative byways taken by those not obliged to focus their minds and time on obligations of the busy world. These are the inspired people, as she calls them, the seers, the village children, crazy, harmless wanderers, perhaps wiser than the same. This is all directly from her essay. And all the uncounted seekers after what can never be known, the mysteries, call them onward to where the, the mind learns to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for their heart's desire. And I just was looking at this last night online and came across, it's slightly, I'm afraid it's slightly blurred, blurred because Google didn't want me to copy it. Um, but pictures in some of the, the uh, real Highways and Byways books of the byways and there's a lovely shepherd and his dog walking by a north of, it was actually from highways and byways in Northumberland this one uh, and you can see hey <laughs> a Northumbrian waterfall through moorland probably but I also love this other one which is of little um, Edwardian children playing with their puppy in the street well in the byway actually so when she's talking about shepherds and farm people and children in, on the byways, this is the sort of thing that she would have seen in those books. Janet's own attraction was for byways, yet her role since 1894 was in the highway. In truth, of course, a person might take either path at different times in their lives. But in her conference, she refers to them as separate ways both with their own saints, but in some ways incompatible. She writes briskly of the highway and reveals her own leanings when picturing, at the end of her essay, the angels gazing rapt after the saints of the byway. However, she also describes moments where the two different paths, highway and byway, cross one another. She doesn't develop any reflections on this idea in this context. It is a thought left unfinished. I want to take it up and explore some moments on her own journey as an RSCJ where the highways and the byways crossed and where she was able to discover the secret byway that wandered with God at the same time as she journeyed along the highway that sometimes chafed her spirit. In outline, this is my argument. Janet was always profoundly attracted to contemplative prayer in the sense of prayer of quiet, imageless, in a dark presence, 
in an atmosphere of God. However, her attempt to live the rule perfectly, which included, for her, putting a break on her originality, her ability to trust her own judgment and take initiative, meant that in the early days she followed a method of prayer that only partly helped her. It did help her, but it only went some of the way. Being called into the service of administration and leadership forced her to begin articulating the fruits of her own prayer and spiritual journey for others. But it was only through her experiences of undoing, of confronting her helplessness and her inadequacy, that she discovered the real treasure of her heart and learned what her true vocation as an educator was. These periods of her life were places where the highway and the byway crossed, and she found that she could access the byway at all time. Um, sorry, I beg your pardon. That she could access the byway all the time she was on the highway. I'm going to focus on two moments. The first, during her journey to South America as Mabel Digby's representative, in 1901, and the second in the spring and summer of 1909, as she embarked on a total of more than 77 detailed Ignatian imaginative meditations with her spiritual director, Alban Goodier. A procedure that ended in a sort of mini breakdown. Now, if I say breakdown, that rather overdramatizes it, but there was certainly a crash. I shall not be arguing, as Goodyear seems to have suggested, thank you, as Goodyear seems to have suggested to Monaghan, that this breakdown was itself the turning point of her spiritual journey. Instead, I believe that the whole process leading up to her crash was the most important part. The crash merely clinching the process. And finally, I shall argue that Janet's difficult journey to the place where she learned to access the byway from the highway is the source of her most important gift to us and is more important now, perhaps particularly, but not only in provinces where formal education is no longer our main work, than the undoubted value of her educational vision as it applied to schools and colleges. She named the gift briefly in her thank you letter to Roehampton that I quoted earlier. She did not live to develop it, and this, I think, is exactly what gives her gift its strength for us now. Okay, next one, just for a change. <laughs> so let's begin with the highway. As we've heard, uh, in, from various people, but Mary's examples are particularly helpful ones that she was sharing with us earlier. Janet's practice of religious life from the novice ship in 1882 until round about 1909 seems to have been a quest for what in her mind was a sort of perfection, at least a perfection of manner. A correspondent to Maud Monaghan, reminiscing on Janet as she had seen during her first major trip, her journey with Mabel Digby as her sort of secretary, quotes, to America in 1898-9. This correspondent remarks that she seemed, quote, the living personification of the rule, the first at every community exercise, completely effacing herself, especially when in Mother Digby's company or at any recreation. This quest for uh, a perfection of manner, according to her understanding of it, was not hypocrisy. Janet was an Aristotelian in her pursuit of virtue, holding that virtues were acquired through practice. This is a method that works well on one level and with some virtues. Temperance, or you know, giving up smoking or something, might be an example, or perhaps cultivating a pleasant, a pleasant demeanour or conversation with other people. 
when you feel just like hiding under a bush. Insisting on silence, straight backs, a smooth contemplative walk, and punctilious obedience to the letter of the law was for Janet a way of staking a claim to a spiritual territory she hoped to grow into at deeper levels. Um, Deirdre Raftery at the earlier conference gave an example of how she was researching in the archives in Dublin and came across Janet's um, visit, you know, the accounts of her visits to different communities in Ireland. And she said it was remarkable that one of the first things she noticed was how Janet would say of the community, you know, a wonderful community or something, and then she'd say, but people must close doors more quietly. <laughs> <laughs> and in New Zealand, right at the other end of her life, just to show that she, she remained the same person in many respects, right up to the end of her life, one of the things she takes um, people to task for in New Zealand is that they're not they don't pay enough attention to the notice boards. <laughs> That's really important. So there's a lot of wonderful spiritual stuff as well, and we heard some of it from Rita, but the notice board also makes, makes its entrance. Um, an early conference to novices dated in 1900 outlines how Janet had at her fingertips a detailed knowledge of the Ignatian method of imaginative meditation. She knew the exercises, the different weeks. She knew the second and third methods of prayer that Ignatius describes at the end of the exercises. She's good on points about posture during prayer and its importance. It's all good stuff. Um, she could even recommend that the novices undertake a looser or freer approach during adoration in the afternoon to what was required in their morning meditation. It was all completely unexceptionable, and reading it, it seems all in her head. That's how it comes across. Her conference does advise her audience to pray as themselves and not try to be someone else. But it really does read like a lecture from notes she has got up. It is, in a way, too complete. And one wonders quite how consistent she was in practice when recommending to her charges that they should pray as themselves. How far did that go? If somebody wanted to come and sort of lie on the floor and listen to music, would, would she have been happy? I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. At almost the same time, um, just a year earlier, she wrote to her spiritual director, Father Daniel, that she felt that she had been in the past and possibly was still feeling that she was, too much the pedagogue, too much the teacher, one who made too much of the law rather than the gospel of Christ in her spiritual guidance of others, and that she had been focused on an unhealthy self-repression, that's her own term, and she experienced herself as someone who had a strained will. So in these early years, the strain between outward perfection of manner and inward feeling was one that she was aware of. In 1899, four years after being made vicar, she wrote to Father Daniel, and Mary has, has mentioned this letter as well, that in spite of her retreat resolution to pray more and think less, she was struggling with overwhelming thoughts that threatened to drown her a choking sense of paralysis that threatened to overwhelm her when she thought about her responsibilities. Her feelings seemed unmanageable. It seems to me that I might as well try to stop a runaway horse with a syllogism, she wrote, telling me. I love that. And this indicated that she already knew that her efforts at complete rational control were doomed. In 1900, after her return from her voyage with Mother Digby to America, she wrote Daniel a letter permeated with seafaring imagery. 
She described her struggle with her lack of self-confidence and her fear of not making right decisions or doing things perfectly. She described this as slipping on a frozen sea. And she said, At those moments there is nothing for it but to make up one's mind not to see and not to feel and not to ask questions, but to remember what one has been told and keep on moving somehow. And somehow, action seems to re restore equilibrium after a time. Or God comes to the rescue. During her voyage to South America, she resorted to drowning imagery. She explained that the isolation she was then experiencing, the necessity of making important decisions without anyone to consult, was, in wonderful um, understatement, a little crushing. But she was trying to trust God's providence and was never drowned. She tells Daniel that the only thing to do is just to keep going. His encouragement helped her overcome the choking thoughts, the waves that washed up over and over again all her words. She was able to draw on this experience in 1903 when she advised her sisters not to use the pickaxe of reason's search for certainty on the ice of doubts, but to trust the intuition of the illative sense which would bear them swiftly and lightly over the thin ice. For the ice way would not bear if the mind rested, but if you pass swiftly and lightly, the end is reached safely. The innovative sense, those of you who are uh, with us in Roehampton, remember Susie Harris talking about this. The innovative sense, her interpretation of John Henry Newman's philosophical coinage, and Janet was reading Grammar of Ascent at, the, at this time. Um, she's talking about the spiritual intuition that enabled one to affirm a belief when reason could not produce a proof and empirical observation could not produce evidence in the outside world. It's a sense, a hunch, a trust, not a logic. In the same way, if you're keen on bird watching, you might recognize a distant bird that you can hardly see by what is called its jizz or you might recognize the identity of a person in thick fog just by their gait, something about them. Or even more perhaps, the nature of a recent encounter between two people by the atmosphere in the empty room when they have left it. You know how sometimes you can go into a room, people have just walked out and you know there's been a row. <laughs> Janet was helped by Newman's philosophy, but she remembered the insecurity and the darkness of overwhelming thoughts, and perhaps continued to experience them from time to time. She shared her experience with the community at Mount Anvil in 1904, that God hides himself under such awful silence that we are inclined to cry out, for charity, truth, and justice's sake, manifest yourself. And yet God's response to this is unchanging. He continues to hide himself. The conclusion? Not to give up searching, she says, but to continue to seek him within the awful silence, within his hiddenness. A second moment where she began to find how the byway might be accessed from the highway was in 1909. During Lent of this year, she spent 40 days praying with texts taken from the Passion Narratives in companion with her friend and her spiritual director, director Father Alban Goodyear, S.J., another spiritual director who was a good deal younger than she. The idea was that he would prepare the points. There's a wonderful little book in our archives um, which Janet 
shared, with, uh, remarkably, she shared with the community uh, in which she had gathered meditations over the last, who knows how many years, three or four years. They're not, they're not dated. And you have the points of meditation. You know, it might be a text from Matthew's Gospel and there's point one, point two, point three. And then the summary and the, the movement of the heart at the end. Before she's even prayed it, she, she knows how she's going to respond or, or how she ought to respond. Um, there's, no, there's no commentary on it. That's all, that's all it is. But anyway, Alban Goodyear was going to prepare the points, pray with them, write his reflections, and then set, send Janet both the points and the reflections. The next step, she was going to pray with the same points, write her reflections, and then she was going to read his. She would then send hers back to him, including her thoughts on his reflections. <laughs> she did all this at the same time she was doing everything else. I mean, it's amazing. And of course, in those days, it would be quite normal to go to Mass about twice a day, maybe sometimes off at more. And there was the office to say, as well as the personal prayers, and then all the business of the, of the vicariate. I don't know how she did it. Sometimes, uh, after all this correspondence between Manorisa House, uh, half a mile down the road, and the Roehampton community, who took these messages, by the way? Someone was sent with them, I think. At some point after all this, they would then uh, sometimes meet and share further, and Maud Monaghan includes a little scene where the two of them are discussing the things of God in the garden. It was a sort of rather intensive mutual accompaniment. According to Goodyear, this experiment was a success, and uh, Janet asked if they could repeat the experiment, this time focusing on Our Lady, in May of 1909. But that was a success. And then after this, she wanted to continue, in June, with a focus on Pentecost. The Pentecost series of meditations did not, however, really get underway, as whatever her early experience, Janet came to find it all too much. She crashed and cried off. Can we have the next slide? Uh, go on. Yes, yep, just, just do this from time to time. Um, on the 4th of June, she wrote to him and returned his points and his notes. And she wrote, I've had a bad time. Everything that has to do with prayer seems to have given way and becomes a complete blank. Just keep going, Janet. All I can see is my own sins and hatefulness, and all I can think of is whether I have deluded myself into thinking that I was meant for prayer at all, and wished for things that were not for me. I have quite a dread at present, almost a repulsion from anything to do with prayer, and it's like losing one's nerve for something in the natural order. The more one thinks of it, the worse it is. If it is to change for the better, God will have to make the next move, for I cannot. Goodyear, who was rather given to exaggeration, described her in his letter to Maud Monaghan about the whole experiment as at this point entering into the dark night. And when she emerged, he said, she had sailed into the light and had no need of him. I would just say of Goodyear, um, he liked the idea of sailing into the light. The other context he uses it in is in a letter to Janet where he says, now you've sailed into the light, um, you know, I, I don't have so many opportunities to, to meet you or something like that. And what he meant was that she'd gone as Mother General or been elected as Mother General in Brussels and going into the light is usually a phrase one might associate, as he did in some respects, with ascent into sanctity, rather than taking up official responsibilities in um, Belgium. However, I think it was not primarily the crash that is important here. In itself, that might have been no more than exhaustion. 
Far more important in my view was the whole process in which Janet was able to share, in a very detailed and structured way, her intuitions and recognitions about what was going on in her prayer life, what helped and what did not help. What is intriguing about her meditation notes and letters of the time is the way she seems to relish following a strict meditation regime, the points of meditation and all that. But as she goes along, she reveals that what actually moves her during her meditation are the moments of quiet, of not meditating. It may be that the process of working so hard on the scaffolding, as she called it in one place, in another place she calls it the skeleton, which I think is an interesting choice of word, um, working so hard on that scaffolding of a method of prayer, of giving it so much concentrated attention, and then, perhaps most importantly, articulating it to another, she learned to listen better to her own inclinations. And the crash that she experienced during the Pentecost series taught her finally something she already knew and did not know at the same time, that the grace of prayer was from God, not from her own efforts, however perfect they were. Next slide. One aspect that she affirms over and over again is her love of quiet. She appreciates Goodyear's notes on speechless prayer, the steady, silent looking at Christ. Meditating on the agony in the garden, she writes, I am quite dumb, as I should be dumb with the most intimate friend in a great moment. Though it is nothing, this very dumbness is prayer, almost an agony, but better than most kinds of quietness. My best sympathy and understanding is expressed by silence. Although the meditation points she is sent by Goodyear focus on all the activity of the passion narrative, she finds that the less event, and I'm quoting again, the less event and action there is in a scene, the more I can enter into it. During her Mary meditations, a bit later on, she wrote, One of the beauties of praying with the hidden life of Mary is that it does not want words and brings complete contentment, such as one can only find in God. Next slide. It seems a supreme act of trust in God to wait and do nothing, and a sort of act of worship to lie fallow before him, like a field in winter. In her 1900 conference to novices, she had mentioned the importance of being oneself in prayer. However, she seems to be learning this in a new way in March to June 1909. Reflecting on Peter's betrayal, she writes, I suppose every friendship with him, that's with Jesus, and every love between him and a soul is the only one of its kind. Each relationship is unique. So the life of prayer must be a discovery to everyone. Discovery on the one hand, but in order to discover, a letting go of control. This required a relocation of confidence away from her own resources and into God's. On imaginative meditation, she writes, that come and see is endless as an invitation to dwell on what otherwise one hardly dares to look at. If I could only become capable of understanding what I see, but sometimes my thoughts come back upon me as so inadequate and unreal that it seems as if I only took an attitude of thinking and feeling and praying while the great realities escape me. I suppose that is the fear that haunts me of not being true. And I begin to think that this feeling itself is an illusion, and that a too definite effort to be clear and true, and to be certain that I am, 
clear and true makes me in reality less true and that God means me to suffer from that very uncertainty and to accept it and to acquiesce in it as a discipline to teach me to go on without seeing and take things for granted and take risks. Next slide, please. In another note, which transforms the choking, drowning imagery she had used almost 10 years earlier, she describes one of the most attractive ways of prayer for her as, quote, to set out from some words, such as, sea of peace, eternal trinity, and to wade out into the bare thought of them until I lose my footing and am overwhelmed. Next slide. In a series of notes on the nature of prayer that she sends to Goodyear at around the same time as the meditations she describes at the same time as the meditations, she describes prayer as a sort of daydreaming with God. I love that. And an atmosphere which... Just tap it, please. No. Tap it. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Um, as an atmosphere which acts upon the soul, she says it alters its quality somehow, although one cannot put it into words. She asks questions that indicate her increasing confidence to rely on her own experience and to question authority. For example, the experience of consolation. Janet, would you mind just going back a slide, please? Thank you, because the other one is distracting. Thanks very much. Um, spiritual books, she says, tell us that God thinks that these types of moments, the moments of consolation, are of no value in comparison to strenuous efforts to acquire the virtue of humility. However, in her view, to oneself a moment like that, um, uh, just a little fleeting talk, is life and is prayer and is far more actual and real than the highest stretch and effort for a virtue. She says that she has read in some book or other that adoration rates inferior as a quality to faith, hope and love. However, in her experience, it comes first and encompasses all three because adoration carries one to God without words, the whole of one's being, and is the most satisfying act a soul can make. In other words, faith, hope and love come as gifts of adoration that is itself a gift of God. In the same notes, these notes are just uh, a couple of sides of handwriting, and there's, there's so much in them. In the same notes, she indicates the greater attractiveness to her of a new discovery. And can we go on to the next slide? Thanks. Oh, hang on a minute. It's the one with the diver that I want. That's the one, thank you. She quotes from a Carthusian mystic, Dominic de Treve, who allegedly died in 1461. Without any mental images, but with the sole force of your intelligence and your will, frequently offer, plunge, abandon your heart and your spirit into the very dear or sweet heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, your creator, your saviour, your crucified friend. She found this quote in a little book of meditations from the Carthusians on the devotion of the Sacred Heart that was first published in the 1860s or 70s for the use of nuns. Um, and there was a more recent edition of it um, in the convent library. We've, we've got it in, in our own archives and in the Oxford Library. So I'm sure it was part of the spiritual reading that people had at the time. This particular quote is the second of the um, 
of the extracts that are in that collection. This is prayer that is non-cognitive, direct, simple, imageless. A prayer of self-abandonment, though still requiring total commitment of intelligence and will. And she would have added, of heart. She is pointing out the contemplative dimension of meditation, the open, imageless gaze in the templum, or open, consecrated space where God is with us in looking and being looked at, in, as Ignatius describes it, in the loving interchange of friends. Positioned still on the highway, she is able to identify the byway, the structure and the freedom of prayer, its wandering between expression and silence. Indeed, the dualistic categories described in highways and byways were, in practice, gradually being abandoned. She seems to be taking steps towards a deeper self-forgetfulness or, to put it another way, more attentiveness to the divine other. It is in this spirit she describes waiting like a fallow field before God as an act of worship, a conscious, alert, but emptied and unselfconscious attention. Rather than merely acting as if one was oblivious of self, the old way of focusing on acquiring a correct manner, which she now dismissively describes as elementary self-abnegation. She wants now, she writes to Goodyear, to live with a constant hush on the movement of the spirit within herself, almost not paying it attention, as too much attention might spoil it all. The true self-oblivion of love she now sees is God's own gift. Nothing to do with her. If we see the moments of 1901 and 1909 as crossing places where the controlled, highly structured, managing framework governing Janet Stewart's interior life was traversed by more relaxed paths, open to going nowhere in particular, through sometimes painful experiences of fragmenting self-confidence and creative experiences of being able to articulate the discoveries she made as she confronted the unknown horizons of dependence on God. How were the fruits of these crossing places made known to her worldwide community? One place to find these insights expressed for others is in the conferences she gave as she visited communities between 1911 and 14. Next slide, please. For example, in her conference to the community in Malta uh, in 1911, the nature lover in Janet found a metaphor that expressed her thought about dependence on God in a way anyone used to the lush pastures of the English countryside in the Edwardian period might have found helpful in the hotter, drier landscape of the Mediterranean island. Drawing from a reflection by St Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, she focuses on the wild flowers around them, planted by God, she says. Often unobserved by humans, they spring up in unlikely places. They grow anywhere and everywhere, on hill or rock. They ask for very little water, sun and soil. Day by day, moment by moment, the right thing is given them. Depending on God and looking to him for everything, our hope, too, must be unkillable. Like the flowers that grow in the bare crannies or on the ledge of a precipice, our hope thrives on the ledges of our greatest fears. It crosses on a bridge of rope, chasms of despair. It trusts and expects the unexpected. It is just on these very uncertainties that it thrives. She made a similar point to the community at Roehampton just before she set out for Australia in June 1913. Can we have the next slide? She comments, we talk about self-surrender, but in fact, we look for substantial bail, valid securities. You can see some of her experiences, Vicar is coming in here. Reliable guarantees. But it is not that. It is the contrary. Believing without security, 
trusting without seeing that matter. We must accept that we won't see, but in hope go beyond all felt certainty, all probability. This, I think, God loves and blesses. In Melbourne, in November of the same year, she returned to the same theme, uh, at first with Alban Goodier of the, the Carthusian prayer of wordless choir that permeates every action. Now the next slide, Janet, is the one where you have to tap, and I'm sorry I confused you before. Um, yes, she imagines Mary living in the presence of God that it was an atmosphere that surrounded her in everything she did. Mary, Janet states, did not meditate. She contemplated. She was contemplation. She did not discourse to herself about the truth. We should not, says Janet, spend time consciously thinking about God in prayer, but instead turn the whole tendency, keep going, the whole tendency of our being towards him. This is the spirit of the rule of the society, of doing common things in his presence, hushed and steadied and silenced in an attitude of expectation. Fidelity to the rule is not a matter of overcoming ourselves, she says, but it is about fidelity to a person in an attitude of self-surrender that is only possible to one who is able to believe herself or himself is loved. The 1913 conference at Roehampton, to which I have already referred, is a particularly interesting one for giving us a sense of how far Janet Stewart had travelled since the days of being too much the pedagogue. Her comments about trusting God to the limits of the outer, or the outer edge of possibility are made in a context in which she almost seems to be satirising her earlier self. She wonders what it is that prevents some people from giving themselves completely to God. And she identifies various common inhibitions. For example, the zeal to be right, a longing for certainty, to feel perfectly secure about everything. Also, the effort to make things go smoothly, the effort to go about alert, assured, perfected, to complete everything with a finish, even the effort to reveal oneself with limpid sincerity and to be quite true, which she herself had often desired to be, was misplaced. The only peace in life is accepting uncertainty. This is the real poverty she said. Sailors, in many of her references, look for landfall and travellers for home. She alludes to a poem by her favourite author as a teenager, Goethe. I think she alludes to it anyway. <laughs> the child Mignon, Mignon in Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister sings a song in which she points the way to a land yonder where lemon trees bloom and a glittering palace stands, and polished mountains rise. Dahin, dahin, it is there, sings Mignon, there I'd be gone, to be with you, O my beloved one. Beyond what we see or feel or get security for, says Janet, there, yonder, lies the land. The byway leads to it, the byway of what God would do in us if we let him, she concludes. Finally, this brings me back, can we have the next slide, to the tension within highways and byways, between the two ways. There was a tension within Janet between being a, polished, a polisher and finisher of perfect works and the person she ended up being. A person, however, who died almost before she had begun. Well, that's consistent. But in December 1909, after what I call a, her prayer-a-thon, if you think of a marathon, her prayer-a-thon and its ensuing crash, 
She told the Roehampton community that no one would imagine a ship would arrive at port after a long sea journey as trim as it had set out. I love this photo as I was saying to the people at Roehampton because it's not very trim. She's sailing, she's billowing along, but she does look a bit untidy. And she, as Mary pointed out, Mary Hine pointed out to me, she isn't wearing corsets. And this is a good thing. Um, we learn in failing, she reassured the community. Her germ of an idea, informally expressed in a letter, the one I began the talk with, that the thirst of the world for spiritual things was the same as the society's own thirst, and the vocation of members of the society to discover and make known the love of God was what they should be doing, in teaching, yes, but also in every form of personal contact, every relationship, every, com every conversation. I find it helpful that she left this shift of focus as an idea, and left a memory, too, of herself as someone who had tried to live it in her own life, and left it unfinished. As Pope Francis reminds us in Gaudium Evangelii, we have to be evangelizers, and he, he has a particular um, definition of this. People who are able to begin things, not people who are fixated on polishing off and finishing a perfect work. That's in section 222. I couldn't believe it when I saw that. In her spiritual journey, Janet left one kind of highway, the highway as a road of spiritual control, the self-assertion of the metaphorical motor car. The highway she travelled on from 1909, in the remaining years of her leadership in the Vicariate and later of the Society, was one that was permeated with the values of the byway, slowly but surely, initiating processes, accepting of uncertainty, speaking of what she had seen and heard. And in this way, for us at least, I think she was a true evangelizer, and thus true too, though in a way that might have surprised her, to the context of her roots in evangelical Anglican Christianity, which I spoke about before. I'll leave us with that thought.